The National Com Academies is committed to fostering a professional, respectful, and inclusive environment where all can participate fully in a harassment-free and discrimination-free atmosphere. And we look to each and every one of you to be a partner in this commitment by helping us to maintain a professional and cordial environment. I'd also like to ask that each time that you turn your microphone on, or if you're online, well, <laughs> turn your microphone on, that you introduce yourself, just your first name, and that you avoid acronyms. There will be one we'll probably hear quite often, Beezer, for the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources. We'd like to try to uh, avoid that. So the Board on Earth Resources, uh, or excuse me, though, the, uh, the little uh, background on the National Academies is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that provides independent, objective advice to inform policy with objective scientific findings, spark innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. The Board of Earth Sciences and Resources was established in 1988 to provide a focal point for activities related to Earth science policy. And you see here the uh, committee membership. And through its committees, panels, and working groups, the board oversees a wide range of Earth science issues, including the environment, natural hazards, resources, geographic science and geospatial information, data and education. And I invite you all to look through the agenda booklet for the members' bios. And the Committee on Earth Resources is a standing committee of Beezer and is responsible for developing activities of Earth resources and providing a forum for the exchange of information between the Earth sciences community. And again, the committee is chaired uh, by David Spears, who you'll hear from in a little while. The members of this committee are shown here, and I invite you again to look through the agenda booklet for the members' bios. So, David, I'll turn it over to you now to introduce our meeting topic. Thank you, Isabel, and good morning, everyone. Is brines as a resource for critical minerals? And let's just take a second to think about those words, brines as a resource. It wasn't that long ago that brines were primarily thought of as a disposal problem. Uh, in 2017, just seven years ago, under the guidance of this very board and this very committee, the National Academies hosted a workshop that was called Flow Back and Produced Waters. And the proceedings of that workshop are available on the Academy's website. And if you read through them, the discussion was primarily, what do we do with all this salty water? At the time, hardly anyone was thinking about the solutes in that water as a resource. So one of the charges to the Committee on Earth Resources and really to all the committees at the National Academies is to look ahead. What are the changes we see coming in the earth resources landscape? And what can we do as a committee to bring together the people who are leading those changes and have a productive conversation about the future? That's what we're doing today. We're looking ahead. We've got leaders in this room, people who are leading uh, the, the whole science in the area of Brian's future. So as the global energy transition accelerates, geologic brines are an increasingly important resource category, which offers the potential for economic critical mineral recovery with potentially lower environmental impact than conventional extraction methods. Brines are defined as basinal or canate waters with elevated concentrations of primarily sodium potassium salts, sodium and potassium salts, along with other dissolved metals and minerals. Specific mineral resources, of course, depend on the geologic setting of the brine and may include things like lithium, manganese, boron, bromine, phosphates, potassium, magnesium, soda ash, sodium sulfate, and rare earths. Brines can occur as co-produced waters with oil and gas. Uh, brines may be associated with geo, may be independently produced as standalone resources. In this webinar, we will examine domestic mineral resources found in brines. We'll also examine the origin and longevity of the resource, the different mineral extraction technologies, and the potential environmental impacts of developing these resources. Um, our panelists have compiled a list of recommended references that we will page through quickly here. Um, 
page through. There we go. Uh, suggested references. There we go. Suggested references from our speaker. So that's quite a list. Uh, you don't need to copy it down. You don't need to read through it now. But if you'd like to refer to it, you can go back to the recording of this meeting and um, take a screenshot or take a screenshot right now. Um, so we're going to begin. And our first speaker is Jennifer McIntosh. Jennifer is a professor and university distinguished scholar in the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Arizona. And she's a joint faculty member in the University of Arizona Geosciences Department. Jennifer, please take it away. Thank you, David. Margo, will the slides show up on one of these monitors so that I can see them? Or should I step away from the podium? Okay. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to give an overview on the hydrogeological origin of brines. There are three different types of lithium brines and brines in general. The first is brines that are found in sedimentary basins, which may or may not be associated with hydrocarbons. Brines that are produced with oil and gas are called oil field brines. These brines are low temperature, less than 100 degrees Celsius. The second type are brines that are found in closed basins or salars. They're also low temperature. We sometimes call these brines continental brines. And then the third type is geothermal brines, which are over 100 degrees Celsius. I think it's important to note that in lithium and other critical mineral brines, we often find a mixture of these three different types. So for example, I'll show at the end of my talk, geothermal brines that are inputted to sedimentary basins or closed basins that bring things like lithium. There's evidence of sedimentary basin brines and closed basin brines that circulate through geothermal systems. And there are some locations where you find sedimentary basin brines at the bottom of closed basins as they transition from marine to more terrestrial environments. In my mind, one of the best ways to distinguish between these different types of brines is to look at their stable water isotope composition, because that tells us something about the origin of the water. On the left is a plot of the hydrogen versus the oxygen isotope composition of the waters relative to the global meteoric waterline where rain or snow precipitation will plot. Brines within sedimentary basins, such as the Appalachian, Williston, Gulf Coast, and Paradox basins, come from the evaporation of seawater in the geological past that forms this hook-like pattern. These high density saline brines have been diluted along their margins by meteoric recharge. There are some locations that I'll highlight where you actually see meteoric water that's dissolved salt to create a brine. Geothermal brines, on the other hand, often come from meteoric water that has then been modified through high temperature water rock reaction, which increases the oxygen 18 plotting to the right of the meteoric waterline, such as we see in the Salton Sea system. Closed basin brines, such as in Clayton Valley, may have some input of geothermal waters, but these brines primarily get their salinity from evaporation of groundwater that has a meteoric origin and plots along this evaporation trend. So now I'm going to go into more detail into these three different types of brines and their origin. So starting with sedimentary basins, this is a map of the United States showing the 95th percentile of lithium concentration in these brines. As you can see, the highest lithium concentrations is found in sedimentary basins that have a marine origin. So they have evaporite minerals that are precipitated from seawater and residual brine that came from evaporation of that seawater. As seawater evaporates, um, salts are left behind, like chloride and bromide, and we'll see lithium. The plot on the left is chloride versus bromide, and in the black line is the evaporation of seawater. These brines in places like the Appalachian Basin are highly evaporated seawater going back hundreds of millions of years ago to the Paleozoic. As seawater evaporated, it precipitated halite and often potash salts, which are found in these basins, and then those residual brines that are highly saline and dense. 
There is some salt recrystallization enriching these brides in chloride. But again, many of these brines at the margins of these basins have been diluted by meteoric recharge. And again, there are some locations where that um, brine has been displaced and fresh water has dissolved salts. And we can distinguish those types of brines based on their chloride to bromide ratios. These seawater, eva evaporated seawater derived brines have been modified through water rock reaction. So compared to evaporation of seawater, we see these brines are highly enriched in calcium and depleted in magnesium. And that's because of diagenetic reactions with carbonate and silicate minerals. At the same time, lithium is highly enriched in these brines relative to the evaporation of seawater. We see the same pattern with potassium. The magnesium to lithium mash ratios in sedimentary brines are variable, although the median is usually greater than 10. Again, if we look at lithium versus chloride to bromide ratios, we can see that the highest lithium in sedimentary basin brines comes from the ones that derive their salinity from evaporation of paleo seawater, where brines that get their salinity from dissolving salt generally have low lithium co concentrations. So turning to the second type of brines within closed basins, these brines come from meteoric waters that circulate through mountain blocks or are recharged at the mountain front. They carry solutes like lithium from mineral weathering. And then as these meteoric waters flow through these basins, they react with the sediments. So through dissolving or precipitating minerals, lithium becomes concentrated, as well as through absorption and desorption reactions with clays that can be sources or sinks of lithium. The time scales of circulation of these closed basin brines ranges from hundreds to tens of thousands of years. Extensive evapotranspiration in the center of these closed basins removes water, which is the only outlet, and leaves behind evaporite minerals, salts like lithium, which becomes enriched in the shallow brines that are left behind, and saline lakes. The highest lithium brines in closed basins tend to be in ones that have a salt crust or playas and only ephemeral saline lakes. As groundwater evaporates in these closed basins, a series of evaporite minerals precipitates and the final brine composition changes, depending on that initial groundwater chemistry. So for example, if the groundwater is enriched in carbonate, say from a magmatic CO2 source, then you tend to precipitate magnesium salts, natron, trona, and halite, and the residual brine is enriched in sodium, carbonate, and chloride. This type of brine we find in places like Mono Lake and Cyril's Lake, again, where you have magmatic CO2. If the groundwater was enriched in calcium and sulfate, then you tend to precipitate mirabilite and halite, and the residual brine is enriched in sodium, sulfate, and chloride, like we find in the Great Lake. If the brine was enriched in calcium relative to carbonate and sulfate, you tend to precipitate gypsum and halite, and the residual brine is enriched in sodium, calcium, and chloride, like we find in Clayton Valley. If lithium is present in the inflow waters, either from weathering sources or geothermal inputs, lithium will be enriched in these residual brines because lithium is an incompatible element that does not get precipitated into these evaporite minerals. Obviously, the sequence of chemistry and evaporite minerals is more complicated depending on the initial groundwater chemistry. Beyond sodium and chloride, which is the dominant cation and anion in these closed basin brines, they can have variable major cation chemistries, including calcium and magnesium, as well as trace elements, including lithium, boron, fluoride, barium, and strontium. On the left is a ternary diagram that's showing the calcium, magnesium, and sodium plus potassium concentration within brines from South America. And I just wanted to highlight the Atacama Desert brines shown in the blue polygon to emphasize the fact that even within the same system, you can have closed basin brines that are more enriched in magnesium, plotting up towards the center, and ones that are more enriched in calcium. So you do get a really wide range of magnesium to lithium ratios in these brines. And I think it's important to note that not every closed basin and not every sedimentary basin brine is enriched in lithium. 
The third type of brine is the geothermal brines. These are fluids that circulate through hot rocks, gaining to high temperatures, and that enhances mineral weathering and the release of solutes like lithium. The fluids in these geothermal systems can come from a variety of sources, including meteoric water, seawater, sedimentary basin brines, and magmatic sources. The heating of those fluids in the production of steam removes water and concentrates salts like lithium behind in the brines. The high temperature fluid rock reaction with sediments such as halite, volcanic materials, and basement rocks can contribute to the salinity, so adding things like chloride, sodium, and other ions. The circulation time scales of water through these geothermal systems ranges from hundreds to thousands of years. And just to give you a comparison of the water chemistry between two geothermal brines in Southern California on the left and the upper Rhine Graben on the right in Germany, we can see that the highest lithium concentrations are found in the hottest, most saline, sodium calcium chloride type brines that are also enriched in potassium. Magnesium is often depleted through high temperature reactions with clay minerals. The brines can also be enriched in a number of other elements, including barium, strontium, silica, fluoride, rubidium, boron, and other trace metals, such as manganese, iron, zinc, lead, copper, cobalt, and cadmium. And this comes from the high temperature water rock reactions, as well as complexation with chloride, which allows them to remain in solution. So the final point that I wanted to make is again, that there can be inputs of these different types of brines in lithium brine systems. So for example, in the Smackover Formation, which is at the bottom of the Gulf Coast sedimentary basin, we can see that the highest lithium concentrations are associated with the highest hydrogen sulfide, which in this case is coming from thermal chemical sulfate reduction. So it tells us there's a geothermal source. And the fact that these brines are enriched in elements like boron, potassium, rubidium that comes from high temperature reaction with clastic rocks and basement. In a closed basin system in Argentina, we see that geothermal brines are being inputted to the closed basin through rivers that transport lithium out into the closed basin that then is highly evaporated and enriching lithium and other elements in that closed basin brine. So I'm going to end my talk with just um, the references that I've, I've put in the slides if you want to take a screenshot. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. And we do have time for questions, so please uh, remain at the podium. Just a reminder to the audience that you could submit your questions to the panelists on our webpage live stream. Look for the Slido box underneath the live stream video. Committee members and in-person participants, people here in the room are encouraged to ask questions. Please raise your hand or your name card and I will call upon you. So um, anyone in the room immediately have a question? Okay, here's... Here's one. Um, yeah. Okay, Jennifer, given the relatively short time scales over which the closed basin brines formed, might we expect future deposits to be impacted by climate change related events such as drought? That my group has addressed in the Southwest. And I think what we've seen from many studies is that if you have groundwater that's circulating on time scales of hundreds to thousands to sometimes millions of years, that climate change impacts such as drought is going to be felt far into the future. So we call that a long groundwater response time. Okay, thank you. Um, Larry, hello, Larry. <laughs> Would you stand up, please? <laughs> Can you go to microphone, please? Still, Larry. <laughs> you didn't mention the effect of uh, wall rocks uh, possibly being leached of lithium, in particular volcanic rocks, which appears in my world to be the most important source of lithium. So could you comment on that? 
Sure. So the question is about the leaching of lithium sources such as volcanic rocks within, for example, closed basins or sedimentary basins. I think that certainly is a lithium source. Um, I specifically didn't talk about that in my talk because I know that uh, Madeline Blondis and Leanne Monk are going to talk more specifically and others about sources of lithium within these systems. Michael. Uh, Michael Manga, Board of Earth Sciences and Resources. Thank you, Jen. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Zorps sorption and desorption process and how, how um, engineering practices might uh, influence those processes? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, I didn't talk about it in my talk because I know that's something that Leanne's going to talk about and is really important in places like Clayton Valley where the circulation of older groundwater, possibly geothermal, would have added lithium to clays, and then the circulation of a different water chemistry would have then enhanced absorption of lithium, and there's still a source of lithium within those clays. So I'll, I'll wait, if you don't mind, for Leanne to give us some more specifics. And I've just been reminded that we have microphones on stand. So if you're in the room and you'd like to ask a question, please go up to one of these microphones. Um, Jennifer, would Brian derived, is there any reason we couldn't um, use Brian derived from desalinating seawater as a source for lithium or other metals? That's a great question. So lithium in seawater um, is not as high as it is as I showed lithium from within sedimentary basins. So you do get some lithium when you evaporate seawater, but then we're seeing it's much more enhanced within sedimentary basins, likely from leaching of these um, sediment or mineral sources. Um, so I'm not sure the total concentration that you get from seawater, but um, you get higher from these closed basins and sedimentary basins is what I'm trying to explain. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some questions from the online audience. Um, have you considered, what's your opinion of the lithium resources in the Michigan basin? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, we published a paper recently where we looked at lithium across basins. And if I go back, I actually have a plot. It wasn't as high as some of the other places like the Appalachian and the Gulf Coast basin. Um, but it is elevated. Okay, thank you. I'll bet that question was from John Yelich. <laughs> uh, um, you're in Arizona. Uh, the Mesilla Basin, Mesilla Basin of New Mexico has some of the highest heat flow in North America and it has elevated lithium concentrations. Is this considered an addition region for lithium extraction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's an area I've done a little bit of work on, not a lot. Um, so I think that that fits more in one of these um, geothermal input type systems. It has a brine that's coming up at the southern margin. I don't know the lithium concentrations off the top of my head, but I, yeah. Oh, okay, well, thank you. Um, anyone else in the room? Yeah. Doug Hollett. Yeah. Um, yeah, Doug Hollett, I've got a quick question that goes to in the direction maybe of basin evolution. Because of the contributing factors, the tide of the lithium concentration, um, is there evidence of zonation in basins? In other words, could you could you make could this be another marker similar to um, uh, uh, you know, hydrocarbon maturation in a basin? Could some of the brine chemistry also be a marker for basin basin history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say take, you know, take a place like the Michigan or the Gulf Coast or the Paradox Basin. Um, you certainly see the highest lithium in the brines that are residual from evaporation of seawater. And so there's a lot of indicators from the age, from the chemistry, from the isotopes of the brines that tell us that that these brines have been retained within the basins. And so there is a stratigraphic relationship. So it tends to be places, for example, shales within evaporite minerals that are a relatively closed system where these very dense saline brines can remain and have not been flushed by meteoric recharge, 
where more open systems, margins of the basins, you see that more recent meteoric recharge has flushed that residual brine and the lithium concentrations aren't as high. Okay, if, if I could just follow up on that. Is, is there any relationship potentially then with uh, geo pressure? Um, for example, in the, in the Gulf Coast region where you might see so you know, stepwise progression of, of brine chemistry? Yeah, that's a good question. There's certainly the hydrodynamics is related because again, once you can get meteoric water in there, you're flushing, you know, that high lithium that's built up over geologic time is not retained. And so there are some basins that have some overpressures and that prevents that meteoric recharge. Again, there's some lower permeability units where these residual evaporated seawater is retained. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. We're ready to move on now. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Your talk. Okay, our next introductory presentation is from with the U.S. Geological Survey's Utah Water Science Center. Scott, take it away. Thanks for that great bio, Margo. I've never really been one for writing in the third person, so. Um, okay, uh, so let me just, you know, I thought I would take the opportunity for us to talk about what is critical, okay? And in um, 2017, there was an executive order. There have been a few draft lists of critical minerals. Uh, one of the important things is, is the Energy Act of 2020 and kind of following that, we, we've narrowed down onto finalized lists now, you'll see the references there. One thing I would point out is these aren't really minerals. Um, so that, you know, a small point, but, and then in the 2021 revisions, I would say there were some additions and some subtractions from the list, uranium most notably, because it's considered a fuel material. Um, and then the SPOF, single point of failure. These are elements for which there's one dominant global supply. And the methodology is quantitative, except for those kind of single points of failure, which is another criteria. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you look at what's critical, it's half the periodic table. Okay, so, um, and only a few of them are really related to minerals. So I think this is useful for us to consider. And then the final thing I'd point out about criticality is eight of the 50 critical minerals are actually traded on the London Metal Exchange. So when we think about economics of research, we can't think of these like commodities, really. They must be considered as, as really specialty chemicals. It's a specialty chemical industry that drives most of this. So if we think about a lot of these as commodities, you know, we're, the economics really don't work quite the same way. And in fact, you might think that something's more secure when it's a commodity because it's actually a free and open market. Um, and then another definition, since, since we can, what is a brine? And, and I, I think about this a lot because, you know, in the process of dealing with um, extraction and development and environmental issues of, of brines, you often run into this kind of conundrum of a conversation. Well, what is a brine, right? And all I would point out here is, if you look at, at specific conductance on the x-axis, um, which is a measure of how, how water conducts a current, um, and the total dissolved solids on the y-axis, you get a nonlinear behavior, right? And if you start down near the origin, you have a linear behavior to some point, it's becoming, the water's becoming saltier. And then at some point, it becomes a different type of material, right? So one of the conversations that you have in these, instances as well, okay, then tell me the water content of your brine. Or, you know, is brine just salt with a high water content? Um, and these operational, so, you know, I'm really a champion of an objective definition. It might be specific to a system, but something that that would, you know, work for, for regulators, managers, resource extraction companies, something that everyone could agree on, right? And then, of course, the other point I would make this is just an example from the Great Salt Lake. But, you know, mass budgets are really important, especially in closed basins. And the water and the salt budgets are coupled, but they must be treated separately. Um, so there's water in that there, Brian, I guess I would say. Um, 
And then quickly, I'll just show you, thanks again, Jennifer, for the good introduction to the, to the different types of brine deposits. And then I took a screenshot here of the database that I'm sure Madeline will tell you more about. And then another one that, that um, we're working on. Um, on the left there, well, it depends. Your, yeah, that would be your left. Um, and those, those red outlines, so that's a, that's a database of lithium chemistry in the Great Basin. And those are closed basin brines. Each one of those red outlines is a closed basin. Uh, we're to the point now where we have about 20,000 uh, lithium values, um, several million entries in this database. Uh, and just, just to show that the, these produced waters in the closed basin brines, they kind of inhabit slightly different worlds, but of course they're not exclusive. Um, and then I thought, uh, I, by way of analogy of a ternary diagram, we, we could sort of just quickly do a compare and contrast exercise about brine resources and, and you know, what, what are the characteristics and, and considerations for producing critical minerals. Um, so one thing I think you'll probably get out of this is every brine's different, right? So the diversity of brine chemistry is high in every possible type of brine. Um, critical mineral prospectivity. Um, I'm of the opinion that the geothermal brines have the highest prospectivity. Closed basin brine's the lowest. You know, when, when Leanne and I used to work on this in Atacama, I always called it the null model. We just take rainwater and run it into a basin and evaporate it, and what's residual? Not much. You start to add water rock interactions, you get a bit more. So the closed basins, I think, have the lowest prospectivity. But of course, they interact with geothermal and, and other kind of reservoirs. Um, the depth of the resource. Okay, so, you know, sedimentary basins, oil and gas brines, typically deep. Closed basin brines, typically shallow. Um, there's an age gradient there, too. And then geothermal brines, right, especially actively circulating ones, they span every depth range you could imagine. Um, and then the consideration as you produce these, what's the connection to the service environment? Um, in the closed basin brines, there's a strong connection. In fact, that's one of the things I'll talk about next is the, is the connection between the genesis of the brine, the environment, and the extraction process. Um, and then I would note in deep, like, you know, in the Marcellus and these types of issues where they had environmental issues with produced waters, the interaction between these brines and, and the service environment is, is really limited except during extraction, right? So that, that's one of the issues um, David alluded to earlier about what do we do with all this water once we start taking it out. Um, and now I just kind of mocked up some ideas of where different types of, of brines in the, in the United States, North America um, might fit on this. And, and, you know, the point here is really that these are polygenetic. You're not going to find anything that's perfectly on a corner here. Um, and they inhabit this kind of um, polygenetic world, which is, is sort of how I think about the genesis. Um, and then to kind of further the point Jennifer made, in a single system, you can have an immense diversity, right? This is just something hypothetical I put up from, you know, brine aquifers, and some of them you might consider reservoirs deeper in the Salar de Atacama Basin. So there's a wide diversity within a single system as well. Um, and then if we think about producing these brines or extracting things from them, you know, the closed basin brines, you know, the challenges are environmental and economic. Does it have an economically recoverable concentration? What are the environmental impacts? In the, you know, the other brines, it's often technical um, and, and economic. And of course, the economics are related to the environment and the technical issue. And then the other issue is water availability for, you know, extraction of minerals. And that's not only quantity and quality, it's also timing. Oftentimes in the Western U.S., when can you have the water actually becomes an issue of consideration. So then I just like since the, the environmental issues, the economics, the extraction and the genesis are so related in closed basin brines, I thought we'd just take a quick look at the trade-offs in exploiting these types of brines. Um, and so they're generated in pretty harsh environments, right? Um, this is an example. This is a Slar de Atacama 
in Chile. Um, examples there of what it looks like to mine these brines. Um, and then the point I want to make about these, these godforsaken places is they're huge and the real estate is cheap. Okay. So if we compare how much that you, you would never have, you can see these extraction facilities, they would cover the whole island of Manhattan. You could never afford the real estate. Um, and if you look at the area and the, and the money that's made in a year from that, it, it won't take you far. Um, Great Salt Lake, it's bigger. Its economic impacts are, are kind of wider, well beyond lithium and other things. I um, mean, it still doesn't even touch the, you know, the scale of, you, you couldn't do that with it, high dollar real estate, basically. Um, and then that brings me to, to another point, you know, about sort of the passive nature of extracting these. And I'm just showing you an oblique aerial photo here of the Great Salt Lake. There's a north arm and a south arm separated by a railroad causeway. The north arm is at halite saturation. The south arm is about halfway there. And they're connected by one opening, one breach in this railroad causeway. And you get dense north arm brine flows south through this opening and less dense south arm brine flows north through this opening. So in an open channel, you have stratified and bi-directional flow. Um, and so, you know, we've done a bunch of work looking at how much lithium mass is exchanged here. The key thing to remember here is all of the freshwater inflows come into the south arm. And basically the north arm has no inflows, save some salty groundwater and a bit of precip. Um, so this is an evaporatively driven pump that, that basically circulates these brines in a passive manner. Um, and then one last example from the Great Salt Lake here, and that's in the colored symbols plotted over gray symbols from the Solar de Uyuni in Bolivia. You'll see on the x-axis calcium to chloride. So as that ratio goes down, and you'll see in the, in the um, lower right-hand corner inflow waters from Great Salt Lake. And then um, I'll just show you here the magnesium concentrations in the clusters for the north arm and the south arm brine. And, and we know that the north arm brine has a residence time of two to five years based on measured flows and the known volume. Um, and you see the magnesium to calcium ratio goes up as the calcium to chloride ratio goes down. Chloride's conservative. We're concentrating the brine by evaporation, but we're also precipitating huge amounts of carbonate. And so this is a, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the enormous CO2 sink that this lake is as well, which is another interesting piece of the mass budgets. Um, and then quickly, so, some considerations over the years that we've run into for responsible development of resources. You need numerical models to get people to buy into them. You need a conceptual model that underpins it. Um, and then you need mass budgets for all kinds of stuff, including reagents, products, waste, if you want to do this responsibly and well and understand the impacts. Um, and then this is some work I did with a colleague of mine. The references is down there. He's a He's not bad for a lawyer. Um, and we we had a lot of fun working on this. Um, and one of the things, you know, that I would say is, is we realized you must measure and you must monitor, you need budgets, um, you know, borrow, it's a shared resource. Uh, cumulative impacts are important. Um, and then, you know, borrow the idea of unitization from the oil and gas industry. It's a comma pool resource. Are we gonna share in the profits? How do we, you know, not compete, but cooperate? Um, and then I was just gonna, gonna end here by showing you this is a matrix of um, lake characteristics in the Great Salt Lake. And then you see a vertical dashed line is lake level. Um, and then each of those bars is, is a different consideration that's essentially managed for. And if you look down underneath economics, there's one line for mineral extraction, right? So this is a kind of a multiple use, uh, managed um, system. And, and in the, in the um, example of Great Salt Lake, magnesium is the primary mineral they mine. And it's basically a single point of failure. This is the key source of magnesium to, um, for aluminum alloys, for, for defense, basically, aircraft and things like this. Um, and the lithium that people are producing out of there is just a byproduct 
from years of waste and, and a new waste stream. So, and magnesium is a, is a critical mineral. So just another way to think about this. Um, water availability, then I would say is the number one issue. Passive approaches to brine concentration are really effective and simple. Um, they're not really in vogue and you need cheap real estate and other things and there are issues. Um, and then of course, the deeper and the hotter we go, the greater the technical challenges will be. Um, and with that, I think I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We do have a few minutes for questions and I've got one right here and then we're going to go to Alex. Um, with the commercialization, I know you're a hydrologist, hydrogeologist, with the commercialization of sodium ion batteries ramping up, do we expect the criticality of lithium to slack off over time? I know you've thought about this. Ah. Well, you know, in one of those papers that, that I wrote with, with, with my colleague, the lawyer, you know, there was a, the USGS had a massive lithium program in the 70s after the Iran fuel crisis and all of this. And I think one of the things that, that I've learned by kind of watching that and then being reinvolved in a new generation of this, we all knew that lithium was going to be useful for energy storage in the 70s. But scaling things from the bench top to a continental scale industry is a completely different issue. Um, so, you know, and I think, I mean, I look at lithium recycling companies that are starting up that think they're going to recycle batteries. And you look at the effectiveness of lead acid battery recycling and you think it's probably going to be a pretty good option for a good long while. I, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, Alex. Hi, Alex Klaus from the Committee on Earth Resources and a lawyer. Wow. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> So I actually have two questions. One is how comprehensive is our mapping and data regarding concentrations of critical minerals in U.S. brine? So like, do we have more information on federal lands versus non-federal lands or certain parts of the country? So I'm just wondering how much mapping and data do we have? How much more do we need? So that's one question. And then the second one, um, has there been is the regulatory regime governing extraction of critical minerals from brines wholly dependent on, is it on federal lands versus state lands, or is there some overarching um, sort of set of regulations that is either being developed or has been developed? Um, well, first I would say, Madeline will probably talk some about her Produce Waters database, um, which is, you know, obviously, you know, a huge amount of industry data there and not much in the Western US. Um, and there's a, quite a bit of information in there, but you know, and then I would say in the same vein in the Western US and other things we've done, when we started looking at lithium, we also pulled tungsten because the USGS Mineral Resources Program had some interest in tungsten at that point in time. Um, but in terms of the whole rainbow of 50 elements, I think that's severely lacking. Um, and you know, in the database I showed, we have federal, state, you know, all kinds of, there are seven or eight different databases that have been ingested. Um, but sort of unification of that and looking across the other elements, I think is is a need. Second question was? Uh, the regulatory regimes governing extraction, whether they exist federal, state, or is it totally dependent on federal lands versus non-federal lands? Right. Well, at least in the Western US, right, it all boils down to mining law. And so from state to state is different. Typically the water rights across states are very similar, but the, you know, in Nevada has, you know, locatable and leasable minerals and a mineral mining law of 1872, and it gets really complicated. And I think one of the neat things with brines is, is there is an opportunity potentially to, to stop being reactionary and avoid some of this path dependence and litigation and maybe even compacts examples like that would be really useful because there's a lot of transboundary issues. Um, but it's all going to boil down to a state mining law, I think, at least in, in the Western US. Yeah. Okay, I see a hand raised on Zoom. Elizabeth Holly, can you please um, turn on your microphone and ask your question? Yeah, good morning. Elizabeth Holly from the Committee on Earth Resources. I'm wondering if you can give us both the historical perspective and perhaps your your forward-looking opinion on 
The potential for lithium recovery as a byproduct of magnesium versus from solar brines like production at Silver Peak. How do those numbers compare? Can you repeat your question, please? Oh, sure. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us both the historical perspective and perhaps a, a forward-looking opinion comparing the potential for lithium recovery as a byproduct from magnesium versus solar brine production at Silver Peak and perhaps other types of brines going forward. How does byproduct lithium compare? Uh, well, the first thing I'd say about Silver Peak is they got lithium as a leasable mineral. They didn't do anything locatable. They have no claims to anything else. So they have big piles of potash and other things that might have some value that aren't being moved because they never claimed that. So there's a lot of, you know, this is waste as a resource. Another thing that USGS is starting to work on quite a bit. Um, and then, for example, in Great Salt Lake, they mine a bunch of magnesium. There are multiple companies that, that do this and they both have brine as waste and it's mostly interstitial brine and salt piles and it's very high in lithium concentration so they've got 20 or 30 years of mining sitting there on the ground in lined ponds as interstitial brine in salts um so you know i think in the near term you know they're going to be using 30 years of evaporation as a head start um but you know going forward you know compass minerals in, in utah had a, a whole lithium line coming online they were going to produce in parallel with their magnesium they use for fire su suppressants and road salt and they just pulled the plug on that um and i think the challenges of the high magnesium brine are, you know they were trying to use dle and other things and and i think that's that's still an issue um i think at least in that instance the lithium is a waste product that you know can accumulate probably but it's going to be a challenge to mine them in parallel i would guess Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank there you. are many, many good questions, obviously a, a rich topic here, but we need to move on. So um, I'm now going to turn it over to Michael Manga, who's a member of the board on Earth Sciences and Resources, and he'll begin our next session. Thank you, David. Uh, and as David mentioned, I'm Michael Manga at the University of California, Berkeley, and a member of the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources. Our next three speakers are going to address domestic resources, and we'll save our questions and discussion for a panel discussion after all three presentations. Our first speaker is Madeline Blondes. Madeline is a research geologist at the US Geological Survey, Geology, Energy, and Mineral Sciences, uh, Mineral, Minerals Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Okay. This is the move forward button. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, my name is Madeline Blondis. I appreciate being invited to this event. Uh, today I'm going to talk about lithium in sedimentary basin or oil field brines. Um, Jen McIntosh gave a great introduction there. Um, so I'm going to jump off from that. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues um, and the US Geological Survey as well here. There we go. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about five main things today in this short talk. Um, the first is lithium potential from existing waste streams. Um, and so this gets to uh, David Spears's question earlier. Um, you know, there is a, when you're using existing waste streams, you can potentially have lower impact. And so I'm going to uh, show you some calculations of basically how much lithium has been coming out of the ground um, just from oil and gas production itself. Um, the next is the origin of high lithium in, in sedimentary basin brines. And I'm specifically going to talk about the differences between uh, what I'm calling shale. So basically shale plays are things that basically need to be hydraulically fractured and conventional reservoirs. This actually gets a bit to Doug Hollett's question. Um, I think there actually is a very good analogy here with uh, oil and gas movement um, and water itself. And there are uh, some obvious differences between um, uh, shale plays and conventional reservoirs. I'll also talk a bit about spatial heterogeneity. If a given formation has high lithium, is it high everywhere? Um, and then I'll talk about a um, recent uh, model where we're basically predicting uh, the lithium resources in the subsurface using machine learning. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, quickly, I'll touch on co-produced commodities um, and also co-produced hazards, you can call them, things that are also coming up from the subsurface during lithium production um, that could either be helpful 
Is that moving? I see some bubbles. Yes. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to show, show, uh, show you and talk about is lithium from existing waste streams. So um, this is not the subsurface. Uh, this is what's coming out of the ground. So on the left is um, uh, water production as a byproduct of oil and gas production. Um, and it's basically summed to uh, different counties. This is a cumulative uh, number. So you can see it's going from 1980 to 2023. So it's just over 50 years of production. On the right, this is data from the USGS Produce Waters database that was mentioned. Um, and to answer your question, it, it's almost entirely industry, at least this, um, this particular data set that comes from oil and gas producers. Um, and so areas that are darker, the darker purple, are areas where there's the highest lithium. Um, next slide is how we actually are combining those to get estimates of lithium um, coming out of the ground. So is that cumulative total from 1980 to 2023, and then we apply the average uh, lithium concentration from the, the database, um, and this is for a given county. So there aren't a lot of places where you have you know, this information for a given well, but we can average to counties for both of them. And just to give you some context here, um, the, the scale or the color bar here, um, the kind of bright blue or the blue, um, and that's fairly low lithium. Um, we're looking at, you know, one of those counties in the 50 years of production from that waste stream could have produced a, a batteries for a thousand uh, electric vehicles. So that's not a lot. Um, as we move up in color here, um, you know, we get up to the to the green. Um, we're talking a decent amount of lithium. And you should notice here that some of these, even though it's not particularly high lithium in the, say, Permian Basin in West Texas, New Mexico, there's just so much water um, that there is still an appreciable amount of lithium coming out. Um, and so the green counties are comparable to, uh, you know, one year of lithium con consumption. Um, and if you start getting into the yellow, you're looking at the, you know, the global producer of lithium. So, you know, all of Australia's lithium production. Um, but again, that's one year compared to what's come out of the ground for 50 years. So it, it's still a significant resource, what's been coming out of the ground and then hasn't necessarily been used. Um, the and, and that can potentially be used. The next thing I want to talk about is the origin um, of the high lithium in sedimentary race and brines. And I want to highlight the differences between shales and conventional re reservoirs. I'm using shales as a, I shouldn't say a convention when I'm comparing it to conventional, but I'm using shale, talk about shale plays, anything you have to hydraulically fracture, it can be, you have shale in it. I know a lot of these are not technically shales. Um, and I'm highlighting here, the vertical line is 100 milligrams per liter lithium concentration, which is a ballpark economic level. It can be economic at lower concentrations, but I'm using that to just give some context. Um, it's only the Marcellus that that regularly has concentrations greater than 100. Um, the other, uh, you know, there are others like the Eagleford only has a couple data points, um, two data points that show elevated values, most or not. And then in the Appalachian Basin, the Queenston um, has a couple data points as well, but it's mostly the, the Marcellus. Most of the lithium from oil and gas basin brines or these deep sedimentary basin brines comes from um, conventional reservoirs. Um, and so this is a plot, again, just showing lithium concentration. You'll see the 100 milligrams per liter boundary. Um, it's kind of in three sections. The, the top is uh, Gulf Coast, Texas area. The middle is the Appalachian Basin and the bottom is, is the Williston. So there are quite a few plays, and I should mention triangles are those, are those shales. There are quite a few plays uh, beyond the smack over, which is the most well-known one, um, that have high concentrations of lithium in them. Okay, um, so one thing to it's important to understand when people have looked, there have been a number of studies looking at um, why we get, you know, why lithium concentration. And it seems to definitely be a function of the amount of lithium in the rock and things like temperature, thermal maturity, um, depth, and those three things are related. But for, for shale plays, the lithium is, is definitely a function of the lithium concentration in the rock. For the conventional reservoirs, the place where we've seen oil and gas move as well as water, um, the rock lithium does not determine the concentration of the lithium in the brine. Most of those reservoirs are not um, are not high lithium reservoirs. The smack over is not particularly high lithium, the rock itself. And so there has to be another mechanism. 
Um, one thing um, that that is that is possible, we see that in many cases where lithium is high, H2S, so hydrogen sulfide, dissolved hydrogen sulfide, is also high. Um, and when that happens, metals are also um, really low. And this is because once you have hydrogen sulfide, any base metal will immediately precipitate out a sulfide mineral. Um, and so, you know, it, this led me to think about, okay, can we actually compare those two? Is H2S a driving factor? Unfortunately, beyond the smack over, there's almost no data. Um, and so where there's actual measurements for single samples. And so here, I'm, this, this, this bubble plot here is comparing um, the reservoirs. So there's a separate lithium data set and a separate H2S data set. Size on both of these is related to the concentration of either lithium or H2S. Um, the color, the first thing that stands out are those green ones. Those are Appalachian Basin uh, reservoirs, and there's no uh, comparable H2S data. There are like two data points in the whole Appalachian Basin that I could find for this. And then the gray dots are ones that are generally smaller, either less, less lithium, less H2S, um, and I'm kind of ignoring them here, but to show you that there are many reservoirs which, with much less of both. And then when you look at the remaining ones, you can kind of match the colors of these big reservoirs. So smack over in red. I actually can't read my own slide from here. Um, you know, there's uh, the Madison uh, in pink, and I'm going to show both of these on the on the next slides. Um, I think one of these is actually a Michigan Basin one that's relatively elevated, but again, I can't see my own slide. Um, okay. Oh, so I mentioned it here. Yeah, basically smack over the Jupiter, Red River, Madison, Edwards, Permian. Um, so there are a number of reservoirs that have both high lithium and high H2S. Um, I'm not going to get into this in much detail, but for places where lithium has been put into solution, sorry, um, for places where lithium, there is a source for the lithium, whether or not it's volcanic, um, from any number of different high, lith high lithium crustal sources. Um, if you do have IH2S and potentially high temperatures in these settings, actually keep that lithium in solution. Spatial heterogeneity, one of the questions, if there's high lithium in one reservoir, do we see it everywhere? Left is um, Appalachian Basin, right is the Williston for formation, left is above 100 milligrams per liter, right is 50. So if you look at the green is the Marcellus, um, the yellow on the left or the orangey yellow is the Clinton. On the right, keep an eye on the pink uh, Madison. So now if we look at the entire sample set, we can see particularly in the pink Madison on the right, even though you might say, okay, the, oh, the Madison has high lithium. Um, when you go to look at different regions within there, we're not, there, there are some places where it's it's quite low. So it's definitely not constant. For the shales, in many cases, it's, um, for example, the Bakken, which is relatively low, um, but it is much more constant. Okay, um, this is um, a study. So my, my colleague, Kathy Kinnearum, um, just finished a paper that's been submitted um, and so basically it's using machine lithium in the subsurface. So now I'm not, even though this paper did include also the what's coming out of the ground from oil and gas production, I'm focusing now on the subsurface resource. And so um, this is a, an important model because it's using geologic and geochemical variables to predict lithium. So even though lithium concentrations in the brine were used in the training data, um, that you know we can actually predict lithium from the from the geology itself. So using things like, you know, thicknesses, depths, temperatures, lithology, et cetera. Um, and so one outcome from this study, um, she found that the subsurface lithium resource, it's down there just in Southern Arkansas. So this is not the whole smack over. Um, just in Southern Arkansas could meet 10 times the IA estimate for 2030 uh, global annual lithium demand for electric vehicles. And the other thing she found is, is that um, hydrogen sulfide in this region is in fact an important driver um, of the of the smack over high lithium brines. And lastly, um, co-production. So are there other commodities when we look at high lithium? Um, if those high lithium brines are in fact associated with high H2S, you will get almost no metals in them. Um, this is a hard thing to plot and show because most of them are below detection. So the data that do exist don't really tell the whole story. Um, and so, um, it doesn't mean that if you have high lithium, you won't get high metals in certain places, but if it is associated with high H2S, and it is in many cases, then that is not something that you can co-produce. Um, another thing is, is, is bromide. I'm not gonna get into detail about that, but often where you have high lithium, you also have high, high bromide, um, although it's not a direct relationship. And magnesium, this has been discussed in the last few, few talks, 
Magnesium is important because it can interfere with direct lithium extraction technologies. The plot on the right is showing in size the lithium concentration and um, uh, the color is the magnesium to lithium ratio. So actually in the smack over, like in Southern Arkansas, you actually have a fairly low magnesium to lithium ratio, meaning that uh, there would be less interference with direct lithium extraction. But in other places, Michigan Basin, Appalachian Basin, you have much higher magnesium there, which would just increase costs. Lastly, hazards. I've been mentioning hydrogen sulfide. It can kill you at very low concentrations. We have to be very careful when we're sampling this. Um, and, you know, if there is that association in some of these places, that's something that needs to be considered when we start producing. And then also many oil and gas brines have naturally occurring radioactive material in quite high concentrations of those, particularly say the Marcellus shale. So uh, radium is quite high there and also in a number of conventional reservoirs. So that also is something that needs to be um, factored in to both environmental impacts and costs. I believe that is it. And thank you. Thank you, Madeline. We're going to be saving our questions for the panel discussion after all three presentations. So come and grab a seat next to us. Our next speaker is Pat Dobson. Pat is a staff scientist in the Energy Geosciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, talking on behalf of my colleagues at, at Berkeley Lab at uh, UC Davis and UC Riverside at MIT at Geologica and uh, also UC, um, the University of uh, Auckland in Australia who did a lot of our uh, reservoir modeling for this work and also thank uh, the Department of Energy for funding this effort. So I'm going to talk briefly on our project on geothermal brines focusing on our work at the Salton Sea. Um, so in the context that we've heard a lot about the uh, three different types of brines, uh, closed basins, sedimentary basins, and geothermal brines. And what we've seen is that geothermal brines have long been recognized of, of having a, of being a source of potential different types of critical materials, such as lithium, and that elevated lithium concentrations are found in, in just a uh, studies that have been done in the Rhine Graben. Uh, by Bernard San Juan and his colleagues have shown that there's a number of extensional areas such as the Rhine Graben that have elevated concentrations of lithium. And we see uh, similar sorts of things at the salt and sea geothermal system. We also see that that there are elevated metals, unlike what we see what Madeline just discussed, uh, that are present in a lot of these geothermal uh, brines as well. Uh, next slide. Now go here. Whoops. Um, so I want to briefly just uh, mention uh, the geology of the Salton uh, uh, Sea area. It's a complex uh, geologic environment. It's going to transition between the extensional uh, tectonics we have in the Gulf of California. We have a spreading center transitioning to a strike slip margin between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And in this area, we have a extension. We have quite a bit of sub high heat flows and we have uh, volcanism in this area. Uh, due to the, the extensive amount of, of sedimentation that is sourced by uh, sediments coming from the Colorado River system, this area is periodically inundated with, with water and with sediments that are really key components to this system. So it's a really nice uh, sort of brewing pot for, for creating uh, ideal conditions for, for, for this type of system. So. Uh, some of the previous uh, uh, presenters have talked about questions about where does the lithium come from? And, and here we have a number of, of potential sources. We have the sediments and, and the waters that come from the Colorado River's um, drainage area. We have surrounding basement rocks that can shed its sediments into this uh, uh, basin. We have volcanism. So we have volcanic rocks and their associated fluids that are sources of lithium. And then we, uh, due to this fact that it is a closed basin, we have the ability of evaporative concentration of the, of the waters to form uh, solar type brines. Some of the processes I mentioned are rifting substance and erosion. We have repeated flooding of this area. So we can see that on the, the sort of the bathtub rings of the ancient uh, Lake Coila that's formed and, and, and evaporated in the past. Uh, we also have weathering and leaching that's accentuated by circulating hot geothermal fluids and hypersaline fluid circulation in this area. 
So one of the things that our team wanted to do was to get a constraints on, on the resource uh, potential for the Salton Sea Geothermal Reservoir. And so this is just a graph showing uh, porosity measurements were made on a sequence of core samples that were collected from a variety of wells in the Salton Sea Geothermal Field. We can see the increasing uh, with depth, we have decreasing process you would expect from compaction and from diagenesis and, and uh, metamorphic activity that's uh, reducing the, the pore space. We can also um, use the look at the fluid chemistry that's been collected uh, to get an idea of the lithium concentrations in these brines. So if we put this all together, we can come up with answering the question of how much lithium is present in the or at the Salton Sea geothermal field. And these are three different ranges of estimates that we came up with. The first one is looking at the proven reservoir, that is the, the, the produced geothermal field that's been in operation for over, over um, 40 years in this area. And that's shown in the outline in, in white. Um, that footprint is a little over 30 square kilometers. We have a reservoir thickness a little over a kilometer and we have a porosity of around 11%. And so then we can go and, and calculate how much fluid is present there. We have about 200 ppm lithium in the brines. And we come with an estimate of a little over 700,000 uh, uh, tons of uh, lithium metal. If we look at the sort of the, the red outline, which is the, the probable the extent of the geothermal re reservoir, um, that gives you a bigger footprint of a, a little over 90 square kilometers. We extended the reservoir thickness a little bit and also bumped up the porosity to take into consideration the fracture porosity in addition to the, the, the um, pore space porosity of the, of the matrix. And use this, using the same lithium concentration of 200 ppm, we come up with about tons of lithium metal. We also then did an intermediate estimate, which is accessible, and we just basically excluded the area below the Salton Sea to come up with that value. So one of the things to think about is this is the resource that's in place. It doesn't necessarily mean we can actually recover from this area. Another big uh, critical uh, concern, I think some of my, uh, the people speaking after me to address this is, is what is the technical um, capabilities of, of using direct lithium recovery? It's never been done on this sort of commercial scale. They're producing on the order of like 50,000 gallons of brine per minute. And that's a lot of brine to process to recover lithium. So just looking at the Salton Sea geothermal resource in context, current context, we've been producing from this geothermal field for over 40 years. Over the last 20 years, the production rates have been fairly constant. And so if you just take the amount that they produce from the geothermal reservoir currently, and you look at the concentration of lithium in those brines, it would be equivalent to 21 and a half thousand metric tons of lithium that's coming up to the surface and then being re-injected back underground. If you look at the context of the graph on that's equivalent to more than 10% of the world consumption of lithium today. So it's a huge potential resource. And that's only a fraction. They're only producing the developed field is about 400 megawatts. Their plans to up that to 800 megawatts of, of geothermal production, which would double the potential lithium that could be produced from this field. So that could really fill in the gap between the growing uh, uh, predicted demand for lithium and what we have available at our uh, currently. So this is a depletable resource. Um, and we've done some reservoir modeling to sort of assess um, how much uh, lithium is going to decrease with time as we re-inject lithium poor brine back into the reservoir. It's going to decrease the concentration and decrease the amount of lithium that can be recovered. And these curves are showing you the solid line is using the existing well field with injection and production wells as they currently are, are oriented. And then taking and putting in lithium, the injection wells further afield. In the past, the reservoir was sort of managed with the idea of producing heat for generating steam. And now we're concerned with chemical breakthrough because we're producing a chemical commodity from these brines as well. So it, it's very clear that it's really important to do an optimal way of recovering the lithium from the geothermal field. And we can see from these curves that you could get enhance your lithium production by 30% just by moving the location of your injection well so that there's a greater distance and more time between the fluid that's re-injected is showing back up at the production wells. So one of the other questions that our, our colleagues at UC Riverside have been focused on is looking at where is the lithium uh, in a, the brines, and it's present in the minerals phases. The average con contents, lithium contents of the rocks range between usually about 40 to 80 parts per million. There's a lot more rocks, 90% rock, 10% of uh, uh, porosity space. And so that adds up to a lot of potential lithium that could potentially recharge this system. In, in, in analyzing this, and we used a, a, a laser ablation 
uh, ICPMS to uh, analyze the lithium in the different mineral phases, we see that the lithium is primarily concentrated in, in hydrothermal chloride. And so it seems like it's primarily in, in the octahedral uh, uh, part of the, of the mineral. We're uh, planning on doing some experimental work with colleagues at UC um, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, to get some better thermodynamic constraints. Right now we're using n member values for cookite, which we are not sure is really an appropriate uh, end member because of the issues of solid uh, substitution. So we can see that the variety of different potential sources, we, we've measured the lithium and the volcanic rocks and the sedimentary rocks, and we're planning on, on augmenting this work in our next phase of our study. So ongoing research, we're gonna be uh, reservoir modeling work with improved uh, gridding resolution and uh, assessment of different options. We're also working, I didn't mention this in this presentation, we're doing a variety of, of looking at impacts of water use, chemical use, air quality, induced seismicity, and a variety of other potential impacts. Oh, uh, real big focus on, on water use because that's a big concern in this area. It's really affected by all their water comes from the Colorado River with the longstanding drought. There's going to be reduced allocations to the different western states, and that could impact Imperial County. We're also looking at uh, other critical materials within the salt and sea brines and uh, what the potential is for uh, doing extraction of multiple mineral phases uh, to uh, provide additional resources. And then also, like, as I mentioned, looking at the constraints of lithium water rock re uh, reactions to see whether or not it's potential that they could sustain production from this resource. We're hoping to contribute to the USGS's effort for assessing the national lithium resources and then also continuing on with community engagement. So that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, Pat. I forgot to turn my microphone on. Our next speaker is Leanne Monk. Leanne is a professor of geochemistry and geological sciences at the University of Alaska, and she's also director of the Alaska Critical Minerals Cooperative. Thanks, Michael. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm Leanne Monk. I'm a professor of geological sciences. I'm a geochemist and a geologist, and I've been working on closed basin lithium brines um, for about 14 years. Uh, so just a quick outline here, and uh, thanks Scott for mentioning the elements. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little bit about, you know, where lithium is produced from, kind of step back a little bit and um, look at the distribution of, uh, where lithium is actually being produced in terms of hard rock brines and what's called other. Um, I'll show you a, a new compilation that we have in review right now on the global distribution of lithium uh, deposit, lithium brine deposits. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the what I call the geologic recipe is for the closed basin brines, and we're um, in the process. My um, extended research group including folks at Brown University, UMass Amherst and UT Dallas are all working um, to update the original um, ore deposit model for the closed basin brines. And we're starting to um, incorporate um, other information about the low temperature geothermal and high temperature geothermal, which you just heard about um, from Madeline and Pat. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what we consider in terms of what controls the size and distribution of brines, um, some future R&D that my um, research team uh, has been thinking about, and then water and lithium. Um, it was already mentioned that water is, you know, a really important part of um, what's happening with brines, and not just the brine, but the fresh water. Uh, so that's the general layout. Um, so this uh, this plot is showing you um, the distribution of lithium production. Okay, so currently most of the lithium that's out on the market is coming from pegmatites, spodumene, hard rock. Um, however, most of the the global resource is within the closed basin brines. This is the global distribution of these three 
um, that you've been hearing about. Uh, we're proposing um, to kind of bring together and standardize. It's good that we're all here together. Maybe we can talk about um, how, how we're going to um, describe these and name them. So we're proposing closed basin, which are the solar type, low temperature geothermal, which are the uh, those associated with the oil fields, and then high temperature geothermal. So you can see that um, most of the lithium brines are actually concentrated um, in the, these uh, mid-latitude regions. And so, and those are dominated by the closed basin brines. So this is the um, original ore deposit model um, for closed basin brines. And um, it was generally modeled uh, after the Salar de Atacama in Chile. And, um, but it's, that's mainly because most of those uh, types of brines occur in South America. Um, but you can see here that um, there are six main characteristics that we had identified, and we're working to update this now, but an arid climate, closed basin with a salar or salt crust, uh, some kind of geothermal activity. We could start talking about um, hydrothermal as well, either happening in the past, the present, perhaps both in some cases. Um, tectonic subsidence is very important because you have to create room for the solutes and um, sediments to fill in the basin. Um, lithium sources, this has been uh, raised already today. And um, in, in the case of the closed basin brines, um, most of the work that has been done so far points very strongly to um, ignimbrates, vol volcanic rocks, as being the primary source, which are then leached by low temperature geochemical processes, um, move through the groundwater, can also be um, not just within the basin, but intra-basin, and get concentrated. So this concentrate the processes like evapotranspiration to, um, put to uh, contribute to that concentration are really important. And um, we're adding a seventh characteristic in the uh, work that uh, it's actually in review right now. And that is specifically the hydrogeology. So the, the hydrogeology plays two major roles. One is basin hydrogeology and how the lithium is leached in the groundwater and brought to the basins, um, to the floor, to the, the shallow shallow when we compare to like low temperature oil and gas related brines. Um, and the second is if you don't have recharge, you don't have production, okay? Um, and it's really important to also consider all of the water resources in these basins. It's not just the brine that has um, the lithium or or whatever element you're concerned with. You have to consider what are the relationships between freshwater, climate, and this resource. So this is the updated um, block model that we are working on, and it shows the relate the not the relationship, but it shows. <laughs> It's hard to do in one block diagram to show all that geology, um, but it shows the types, the closed basin salar, the low temperature geothermal or oil field, and high temperature uh, geothermal, such as the salt and sea, which Pat just talked about. And I think it's really important um, to consider uh, the comparison of the lithium concentration. So this graph shows the mean lithium concentration um, for the three types. So the closed basin has the highest concentrations that we that we know of so far um, compared to the low temperature geothermal and a high temperature geothermal. However, those two emerging types of lithium brines um, are considered, this is simplifying it, but the idea is that there's a lot of it, right? They're high volumes low concentration compared to solar type brines, closed basin brines, but potentially very large volumes. So this is a, a graph of um, the mean lithium concentration basin floor area 
basin elevation and total resource. And so this, this is just for closed basin brines. This is the map that I showed you that's a global compilation of all brines, but this is just for the closed basin brines, which do hold the largest um, resource globally. And what we see when, so we, we look for ways, you know, to help with exploration and other parts of, um, or, you know, other interests. And so we take, you know, we have these very large data sets, but the these um, uh, variables here are one thing that we've noticed, there is some relationship um, to the total uh, resource that is actually held um, within the individual basins. And of course, there's some outliers. And so the next point I wanna make, uh, what else do we need to be doing? Um, so based off of what we have been doing, um, I've identified some areas that I think are critical um, to continue a more, more work and to put more resources into. So exploration at, in the, at the basin scale and um, in the subsurface. Okay, so these are, this is a really interesting, um, you know, situation with these lithium brines, like Scott pointed out, um, you know, these are, these are chemical processes that are happening. This is a liquid um, resource and it, it requires some different approaches um, that are more typical in, in other mineral commodities. Um, the brine and freshwater hydrogeochemistry. So Jen talked a bit about um, chemistry relationships um, between different elements. So it, it's that plus it's the processes. So it's it's linking, you know, where did the lithium come from? What are the the rocks that you can um, remove it from? And then what are the processes that happen to that? water, that brine um, over time that contribute to concentrating it to different uh, levels. And of course, this then all leads into um, a really important thing, uh, it, which is calculating what is the resource, right? So um, the last thing I want to mention is, in the, and our research team is, is heavily focused not just on understanding lithium brines as a resource, but the issues of water in the environment. And it's the water sources, water types, water scarcity, water availability. Um, and so this, this could be a whole workshop in itself, of course, but I, I wanted to um, end with that. So just in summary, um, closed basin lithium brines hold the majority of the global lithium resources. The low temperature and high temperature lithium brines are emerging along other category, which is really volcanic sedimentary deposits. Pegmatites are currently lead, the lead in global production. And each one of these uh, brines, no matter which category it falls into, has complex geology, hydrogeology, and geochemistry that control the formation. And every basin is unique. So um, you, you heard that in some other ways earlier. Um, but it really does require an individualized approach to exploration, production, and sustainability. And water resources are, uh, and the availability of water um, are really the most important environmental consideration that kind of drives all of the other aspects that we think of in the environment. Um, and I have questions on my slide, but Michael's going to tell me to sit down. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you, Leanne. And the references. Okay, so we we have until 12.45 today for our, our panel discussion. So that's just slightly under 20 minutes. A reminder to the audience that you can submit questions to uh, for the panelists on our webpage live stream. So look underneath, the, uh, look for the Slido box underneath the live stream video. And committee members online or those in the room, uh, you can raise your hand or turn your uh, name tag on its side and I'll call on you. And maybe to get started, we have lots and lots of questions already. So I'll start with a couple, and then we'll do people online and uh, people like Doug are already chomping at the bit with his name tag. Uh, but thank you all three panelists for those lovely presentations. 
So the presentations today focus on settings in which we're already extracting fluids, right? Geothermal systems and oil and gas fields. Given what we understand about subsurface brines, are there settings or formations that have the potential to be economic resources that are poorly understood or poorly sampled because they haven't been previously used as a resource? Uh, Leanne, for example, you mentioned ignimbrites as being a source of lithium, and we don't do a lot in ignimbrites, for example, Yellowstone. So come, any, anyone on the panel can address, or all, all of them. Okay, press and then release. Okay, it's like fishing. Um, so uh, I would say to that, uh, one area that I think is um, underexplored are actually um, buried salars. And uh, so the closed basin type of lithium brine that I just described, um, there's ideas that some, some of those um, older <laughs> have been buried and um, may or may not still contain the, um, the lithium brine. And then um, with respect to what Michael pointed out with the ignimbrates, so um, we know that volcanic rocks contain, can contain high concentrations of lithium, you know, like, like a pegmatite, um, which, you know, is similar <laughs> sometimes in composition to a, a peg or to a ignimbrate. However, it's cooled much slower and deeper within the crust. Um, but ignimbrates um, are they're very voluminous and large. Um, they're near surface. And so they actually do have a lot of attributes that uh, mining, people who do mining and exploration may be interested in. However, um, when you compare that to lithium brines and closed basins, the advantage there is the lithium's already in solution. And so if you can mine lithium from a, something that's already a fluid, that's advantageous um, from a production standpoint. Madeline? So I would say within uh, oil and gas brines, um, there's a decent amount of data um, and there are definitely a number of potential formations that could be good targets. Um, one thing to note is that we are data limited by where there's oil and gas production. So even just off of, you know, there, there are places that we've been looking and we say, oh, you know, what's going on? Just there's no, you know, producing oil and gas wells where we can get samples. Um, and so I think that there's definitely, yeah, and this, this has been been happening, frankly, um, uh, in the smack over where, where people are potentially opening up older, older wildcat wells. Um, to test for lithium. Um, so I think, and then in addition, um, you know, I think there's a decent amount of data as far as which formations have lithium, but as far as understanding where it might be within there, there are definitely um, data needs as far as understanding the different parameters, including H2S, um, to try to potentially prospect. Pat, did you want to add anything to this discussion? about un unappreciated sources. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm going to, I'm happy to go on to the next question, which maybe you can start us with. Scott in his presentation made, I think, a pretty provocative statement. He said, geothermal brines have the highest prospectivity. And I'm wondering with, if either of our three presenters would like to debate or challenge that statement. I mean, in Leanne's presentation, she showed that the concentration and volumes, for example, in some of the other settings was, were, sub were substantially higher. Um, sure. So I would say that uh, I wouldn't. I would say that there's uh, there's some challenges with geothermal barns because they have to stay remain at high temperatures when you're removing the lithium. You can't let them cool because of the high concentrations of all the dissolved materials. If you're going to re-inject the brines to for or for them to stay into in, in solution, the brines have to stay at around 100 degrees C, and so that's a that's a technical challenge. The advantage of geothermal brines is that you're already producing them. So you don't have the wells are already in place, and so if you can just tap into it, it's sort of adding on to the process in a much easier fashion. So, I would say, from in, in Scott's viewpoint, we, we've already have a, one leg up on it. We're, we're already producing these fluids. The challenge is the the extraction part, and I think 
some of our uh, subsequent speakers are going to address that that challenge. Um, Madeline, I feel like we should be standing in a triangle like yeah. that turning kind of thing. Uh, no, we're looking at each other rather than the, all the people on Zoom. So um, for oil and gas brands, I think similar leads what you said, the fact that there's an existing industry, there's existing infrastructure, particularly in regions where we're thinking about the energy tra transition, um, you know, moving from oil and gas. Um, so, you know, there are reduced costs in that sense. It's already coming out of the ground. Um, there's already a local buy-in, which I think is quite important too, um, uh, because it, you know, it can be hard to say, create a new pegmatite mine. Um, and then interestingly, uh, you know, I like Leanne's framework of the, the low temperature geothermal versus high temperature geothermal, because it's true, many of the oil and gas basin brines are low temperature ge geothermal, um, and they do get up a bit higher than what was shown there, um, you know, in the hundreds. So I think in that sense, similarly, there's that existing infrastructure that, that makes it a really good target. Just quickly, and it was a log scale, so I, it, it did show hundreds, but um, I think I would ask Scott to maybe define what he means by prospectivity, because I think I think we're on the same page. Um, well, when I wrote that, I was thinking there are 50 critical elements and the widest variety you're likely to get is in hot water that's interacted with a bunch of different types of rocks. So certainly there are technical challenges. From the lithium point of view, I think, you know, closed basin brine with a geothermal inputs probably highest prospectivity. But, you know, I was thinking of the, the rainbow, the full spectrum of elements, I think, I would be curious what you guys think, but there seems to be a wider range of, of compositions in geothermal brines. Thank you, Scott. Okay, Doug, you've been very patient. <laughs> so I'm just curious about the possible intersection with other kinds of mineral systems. You know, appreciating that, as you know, Scott just pointed out, you know, you might get a lot of things dissolved or, you know, in solution in a, in a geothermal system. So what I'm specifically curious about is the possible intersection with um, legacy um, hydrothermal systems or adjacency to polymetallic um, deposits um, or, you know, is there, is there a possible intersection, for example, with sedimentary copper um, and uh, where you've got one kind of system, but it's also carrying other things. And then on the same kind of trajectory, um, uranium is very, very mobile in, uh, you know, redox interactions um, in uh, basins um, throughout throughout the western Western U.S. Is there any intersection of uh, elevated lithium that's also coming out in, in conjunction with uranium? I know there's some in Arizona where the high lithium concentrations are are associated with uh, um, uh, high uranium, but I don't know about anywhere else. I can speak about the closed basin brines with respect to that, and uranium is elevated. In um, I've I've done some work looking at that actually. Um, uranium. There are, are other elements. So Madeline had kind of a nice list for the um, oil field low temperature brines. She was talking about, um, but there are elevated concentrations of a lot of other metals. Um, one, one of them is. Well, it's a metalloid, it's arsenic. So uh, some of the environmental geochemistry work that we've done around these brines um, shows, you know, hundreds of parts per million arsenic. And so that is probably coming from the oxidation of sulfides. Um, th and this is with respect to the Slar de Atacama and other brines in South America. Um, you would expect that because you have sulfide um, minerals that are within the volcan the big volcanic um, arc that exists there in the Andean plateau. Um, and so I, I think that that topic is highly underexplored um, from a closed basin lithium brine perspective. Um, at, the, at the Salton Sea back about 20 years ago, um, Cal Energy was did in, uh, put into place a zinc uh, recovery facility. It, it 
it was abandoned after a couple of years just due to economics. But I think there's definitely there's a resource there. Uh, the companies that are currently looking at lithium recovery are also considering, in addition to zinc, manganese. And it, one of the plays in Europe uh, are the old Cornish uh, tin granites. And so they have high lithium waters, and they're also very much associated with some of these, these old uh, uh, metal bearing uh, uh, intrusions. So I think that there's definitely room for going, looking at you know, ancient systems that have lithium and uh, other metals associated with them. Jen, would you like to comment? Sure, I just want to address Doug's question about copper, uranium, and lithium in the Colorado Plateau, where we've been working. And I would say the highest lithium or what's being explored right now is within shales within the paradox formation evaporites. And those black shales could be the source of lithium. Um, we've analyzed them and they are elevated in lithium. They also could be a source of copper. But for the majority of the copper deposits, like in the Lisbon Valley, it's really more of a shallower source. And that's because we find that the copper is transported more in oxic groundwater than the deeper anoxic groundwater that is the source of the lithium. And the same thing for the uranium. So it's being trapped on reduced minerals, um, but it tends to have a shallower source than the lithium. My name is Rita, sorry. Okay, so the question I have um, to the panelists has to do with the recharge. So for the different sources of um, the brine, the lithium, um, do we have some sort of forecast for how long it is it's going to be? What's the potential for recharge for those different sources? Thank you. I can speak to the closed base and lithium brines. Um, so that question around, I think what you're getting at is sustainability. And um, we we did publish on this um, for the, the Silver Peak or Clayton Valley deposit. And it it really, the, the short answer is it, it depends a lot on each basin. And so when I talked about recharge, um, into these basins at the watershed scale. It's important because if you're not recharging with um, meteoric water, meaning, you know, water that falls <laughs> um, from the sky in some way, that infiltrates um, and it runs off, you know, various um, hy hydrologic pathways. But that process and bringing more water into the system is, is critical. Um, because it, it's it's linked to the resource, right? So like Scott said, the brine is composed of water plus solutes. So you have to continue to have water. And um, we are working on, on this problem and linking this to geologic time and climate change, droughts, mega droughts. Um, th those things do matter and they the, the long-term um, climate pattern is really important to understand so that you can assess what your impacts are, your mining impacts, because um, if you don't know what's happening as the baseline by natural processes, you, you don't have an idea of, of what you can extract sustainably. Just adding on to that for the geothermal uh, context, in addition to meteoric recharge, obviously there's reinjection of the geothermal fluids back underground. Uh, for the Salton Sea field, uh, it's a flash uh, plant. So that means you're losing about 20% of the total mass that you produce from your production wells to the atmosphere and the cooling towers. So over time, there is going to be a decrease in reservoir pressure that's going to affect the productivity of the wells and also could result in some surface subsidence. And I would basically say it's uh, very similar for the oil and gas brine. So most of the water, the wastewater is is reinjected. Um, <clears throat> that's currently for the, the bromide industry. That's what they are, are doing currently. Um, so yeah, most of that water would go back into the subsurface. And as far as if you're talking about if you would create more lithium, <clears throat> that's probably on a much longer geologic time scale. Madeline, following up on uh, your presentation, when you uh, shared your your data on the uh, shale formations broadly defined, you pointed out that only the Marcellus shale has significant amounts of lithium. 
Uh, can you expand a little bit on why you think that is the case and whether there's lessons there for um, subsurface lithium deposits more generally? That I'm not sure I have a great answer for. Um, the Marcellus itself does have a decent amount of lithium in it. Um, and so, I mean, that would be an easy thing to test as far as looking at different rocks, uh, you know, similar type reservoir rocks. Um, and it's also under the, you know, right conditions um, of say thermal maturity, temperature, et cetera, where it's, um, where it's basically being put into the fluid. Um, I think that most other shales just aren't high lithium. And unlike the other reservoir rocks, in the conventional settings where you're actually getting fluid flow from other reservoirs, you're not necessarily getting that into, into the shales. Doug. I'm just, I'm curious about, um, has there been much work, I'm thinking probably lab work, that goes in the direction of reaction rates? So if, if you're, you know, if you're extracting lithium out of a basin and then putting, uh, putting, putting water back in the subsurface, um, what is the reaction rate that that will then start driving more lithium back into solution? Is it is is that an active research topic? Is it a potential research topic? I'll give a very quick answer for Brian's. You know, in in many cases where the source of the lithium is not where it's currently pooled, so it does that wouldn't necessarily apply to those settings. So, um, so I guess for a geothermal setting, your reaction rates are going to be faster. However, it really depends on the mineral that the lithium is incorporated in and, and how much it wants to give up that mineral. Okay, so we're currently doing some experimental uh, uh, lab work to ascertain the reactivity of, of lithium bearing chloride. This is with folks at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. It's funded by DOE. Yeah, and similar for the closed basin lithium brines, we, we have done some work. Um, doing ex experimental leaching um, of potential source rocks, so volcanic rocks, um, the clays. This was a study done in Clayton Valley, and we're actively working on this um, for uh, ignimbrites um, for, for South America. Um, and the lithium isotopes are extremely important to use as a tool um, for this in, in all settings. So high temperature, low temperature, um, you know, the solar brines, which I guess are, could, could also be considered low temperature in, in terms of geochemistry, how we define that. Um, but yes, it, it's active, but it could be a lot more active. I should mention what, one more thing right now with lithium isotopes, there's kind of a temperature gap for where um, oil and gas brines tend to be. And I do have my colleague, Andy Masterson, is currently doing experiments, basically trying to constrain the lithium isotopes for that for that temperature range, um, which could help constrain this, this whole process. We are at time, but I did want to invite our three panelists and then our earlier presenters, if they want to share any last minute thoughts or words of wisdoms or greatest challenge and opportunity before we wrap up. And maybe we can, it's unfair because I didn't give you any heads up. So we'll start with Jennifer because she has had the most time to digest. So this might, this might seem like a random point, but I wanted to follow up on Madeline's great presentation where she showed that in places like the smack over H2S is such a good indicator of lithium brines. I just wanted to make the point that there are H2S systems in sedimentary basins that are biological in origin. And that's because these sedimentary basins, you know, the H2S comes from sulfate evaporite minerals that either gets created by high temperature, which could also relate to enrichment in lithium, but low temperature biological processes tend to be shallow and don't enrich brines and lithium. And this is actually why I really like Leanne's uh, way that she's describing, um, you know, the low temperature versus high temperature geothermal. So I, it's a, a succinct way to say that that, that process would only um, be relevant for the low temperature geothermal systems, which are high temperature brines, oil and gas brines. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, mention that I think bringing this team together, all of the people that are here and um, 
trying to advance how we think about direct lithium extraction and the, the chemical engineering that goes into that. There's a lot of parallels to the, the natural system and the geochemistry and the processes. And you know, there, there's a lot of parallels there that I think would be um, really good to start to explore further. I guess one of the things is we that the group has highlighted is just the the variability and heterogeneity of these systems, and so that's going to be a challenge for DLE as well because it's like it has to work for more than just one brine composition. It's got to work for a variety of brines. Okay. So on on that note, I did want to thank all three of our presenters for the ses second session on domestic resources and our two introductory presentations today. Uh, we're going to take a short break and I think we resume again at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. So let's thank our speakers once, one last time.